All right, thank you, Dr. Voss. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Eugene De Pasquale. Eugene used to be here with us at UCLA for the last five years, but recently took the journey to the other side of the town um, at USC. He is now the Director of Heart Failure Transplant and Mechanical Support at USC. He is also the chair of the ISH ISHLT Heart Transplant Guidelines, and you may have seen him on SportsCenter last month as the uh, doctor at the US Open. Eugene. Thank you for that introduction. Now I have the uh, unenviable task of covering the new changes in 15 minutes or less. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about a little bit when this went into effect, why the change in the first place, what are these changes, and what are the implications? So as uh, Dr. Boss mentioned, this uh, system went into effect October 18th of last year, so it's just shy of its first year anniversary. And why this change? Well, there was a, a feeling in the community that the, uh, the system was not perfect and there, were and there were patients who were dying on the wait list who weren't being uh, correctly prioritized. And as you can see, this is the, 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 the former system and the, this is from the modeling to create the new system. And uh, this is the waitlist mortality in patients with uh, moving from a three-tier to a six-tier system. And this incorporates the change uh, with the six statuses plus a broader sharing of organs nationally. And so the results of this change looking at the statuses are that the, the waitlist mortality uh, tends to decrease in the higher acuity statuses. So status one is the most urgent, down to status six, status six, which is the least urgent. And you can see at least for statuses one, two, and three, there is a decrease. For statuses four, five, and six, there really isn't much of a change as you move from the former system to this uh, broader sharing plus the six tier system. Uh, transplant rates uh, are more or less the same, although there was a slight decrease, but uh, more uh, more illustrative is this look at the different tiers. So moving from status one through status six, at least within the statuses one and two, which are the highest urgency statuses, there is an uh, increase in the transplant rates, which was the goal of the new system to try and prioritize hearts for the sickest of the sick. And so this new change incorporates not only uh, the, the change into the sixth tier system, but a geographic change as well. And this is a busy slide, but it illustrates the change from the former system of allocation to the new system. And so I'm just gonna illustrate an example of that using uh, our uh, region of California. So uh, with the old system, the highest priority was status 1A, so highest urgency. Uh, and there's 1B and then status two was the lowest urgency. So with a former system, if a heart became available for the local DSA, and that stands for donor service area, so if it became available here in Los Angeles, it would get prioritized to the status 1As and then 1Bs in the, uh, these centers here, so Cedars, CHLA, UCLA, USC, and Loma Linda. And then if it, no one took it from the 1As and 1Bs in this region, then it would go to all the centers within 500 miles, so this first circle, uh, to their 1As and the 1Bs before coming back locally to us for the status 2s and so on. So with a new system, there's uh, greater, not only are there the six tiers, but there's greater geographic sharing. And so what that means is for status one and status two, the, uh, the hearts become available to all the centers within 500 miles right off the bat before coming back locally for the status threes at, in our local DSA. So uh, UCLA, USC, plus these centers. And then it goes out to uh, all the status ones and twos within a thousand miles before coming back to us for status fours and so on. So this is really trying to prioritize the sickest of the sick. Uh, but who are the, the sickest of the sick? And I think Arnold uh, showed uh, this representation of the new system. And so essentially the former system was 1A, 1B, and 2. And what the Thoracic Committee of UNOS did essentially was split apart status 1A into three different statuses based on the mortality of the, the subjects within these statuses. So you have the, the sickest of the sick with ECMO down to status 6, which is really the equivalent to status 2. Now I'm going to talk about this uh, during the course of my talk, but I want to uh, make note of two things. So one, these red asterisks 
include uh, another change in the system. So not only are these therapy, do these therapies give you uh, priority to be in the status, but there are also hemodynamic requirements that are attached to this. So it's not enough to just be on ECMO, you also have to have hemodynamic parameters to warrant being on ECMO. Additionally, status four, equivalent of 1B, starts to incorporate for the first time in the status systems uh, the patient patient-specific factors, most notably uh, the diagnoses, and, and for the purposes of this uh, meeting, uh, congenital heart disease, as well as the hypertrophs and restrictives. So what is cardiogenic shock? And this was under heavy debate in the, the working groups, as well as the thoracic committee that were working to create this new system. And they ultimately settled on using the AHA consensus conference uh, which define cardiogenic shock. And so the purposes of UNOS for listing, uh, that means that within a seven day period, within 24 hours, you have a stock blood pressure less than 90, an index less than 1.8 if you are uh, with not on inotropes, less than two if you are, a wedge pressure greater than 15. If you can't obtain that, then uh, you either have, uh, you have to have one of the followings, so either CPR, a systolic pressure less than 70, lactate greater than four, or severely elevated uh, transaminases. And the other uh, part of this data system, it's not merely enough to just say you've had that once, but you have to show that they still meet that level of uh, hemodynamic support. So that means that within a 20, 40, 40 hours prior to re-upping uh, your status, you have to meet these hemodynamic parameters, and you also have to have demonstrated a contraindication uh, to durable mechanical support. And if you don't meet those correct, and if you, and then ultimately this goes to a review board uh, that was, represents a different region to adjudicate whether or not this is appropriate or not to remain in that status. And if not, then you downgrade to status three. Now, what qualifies for status one? These are patients who are on ECMO support, uh, and again, with a, with a cardiogenic shock criteria. Uh, patients who are BIVADs that are uh, non-dischargeable and surgically placed, and VAD patients with uh, ventricular arrhythmias. And as you can see, there's criteria, and, and for some of these uh, components that qualify for your status, I'm gonna to touch on it, but I'm not gonna go into great detail in the interest of time. But for patients with life-threatening ventricular arrhythmias, and this will come uh, into play with status two as well, these are patients who uh, you know, failed medical and surgical therapies as deemed by an electrophysiologist, or require the addition of an RVAD to their LVAD for uh, hemodynamic stability. Now status two, these are patients who have total artificial hearts. These are patients who have uh, BIVADs but are able to be discharged from the hospital. Uh, patients with single ventricle physiology who have mechanical support uh, qualify for this status as well, uh, as well as ventricular arrhythmias, amongst other things you see mentioned here. Uh, now, ventricular arrhythmia, I'm not going to uh, go into too great detail because it's pretty similar to that for, for VADs, but suffice it to say, you failed medical and surgical therapies as deemed uh, by an electrophysiologist. Now, at least within the old system, uh, the most common patient to be, uh, or most common way to get patients to transplant was via inotropic support. And in the new system, this falls into status three. So these are patients who are in inotropic support. Uh, who have an invasive pulmonary artery catheter measuring their hemodynamics. They too have to meet hemodynamic criteria, so the same ones that we mentioned previously. Uh, additionally, they have uh, t uh, their um, dose requirements for their level of inotropic support. So they have, they have to be in one high dose inotrope, and you see the limitations here, or uh, at least two drips with these minimum dose requirements uh, here. Now, like the other statuses, this is not one and done. You have to uh, continually meet this uh, human neck requirement every 14 days. And so what that means is you either have an index of less than 2.2 on your current level of support, or there was an attempt at weaning and your index fell below 2.2, uh, your creatinine rose, you had an increase in lactate, or you had a low SVO2. Now, there are other things that qualify you for status three as well. Notably, the majority of the VAD complications fall into this. And so if you have device thrombosis, if you have right heart failure, uh, device infection, mucosal bleeding, urinary insufficiency, these all require, would, um, would give you status uh, three listing. And I'm just mentioning these here. There's a lot of details, uh, uh, additional requirements to meet the, this uh, status. So it's not just enough to say, hey, this person has RV failure. They have uh, other things that they need to meet to justify that. 
And other things, as uh, mentioned before, so if you're supported with ECMO, balloon pumps and pillows, uh, other percutaneous devices, uh, you downgrade if your request for continuance is not approved. And then all bad patients get 30 days of status three time. They can use it at any point in time. Otherwise they downgrade, otherwise they can be listed status four. And so to talk about status four, which you know, is pretty equivalent to the status 1B with a not notable exception of these uh, new additions of patient-specific spe patient factors, uh, such as diagnosis, such as congenital heart disease, so patients with unrepaired or, inc or incompletely repaired uh, congenital heart disease, uh, patient uh, repair congenital heart disease with two ventricles or single ventricle physiology with Fontan or other modifications, in addition to hypertrophic restrictive cardiomyopathies, amyloid, retransplant, and everything else that you see here. And I'm gonna touch on some of these things. And so for inotropes without hemodynamic monitoring, again, you still have to meet some level of uh, hemodynamic criteria and their minimum dose requirements. Uh, additionally, for amyloid hypertrophin restrictives, uh, you have to have at least one of the following, so either a history of uh, ventricular arrhythmias, history of syncretic death, class three to four heart failure, or class four by the CCS uh, system angina. Uh, retransplant, uh, I mean, obviously you have to have a prior heart transplant, uh, but uh, these are patients with severe vasculopathy or class three to four heart failure. Now, as mentioned in uh, one of the talks earlier, the congenital patients don't neatly fall into all the statuses that I mentioned. And this was a problem with the former system, as I'll get into. Uh, but there, the, the um, UNOS developed a guidance document to uh, help determine how to uh, upgrade these patients. And why do they do this? Well, the number of congenital patients uh, continues to rise. These on the left is the patients who are listed for uh, transplant and on the right are the number of transplants. And you can see it's not quite one-to-one. -one. And uh, in this manuscript, uh, looking at uh, competing outcomes for congenital heart disease, you can see that in, in red is the congenital patients uh, and black is non-congenital. You can see that the congenital patients don't get transplanted at quite the same rate as the non-congenital patients and that they're removed from the wait list compared to the non-congenitals at a greater frequency. So there's various reasons for this, and, and part of it is that the, the former system didn't quite meet the, the needs for these patients. And in a more recent manuscript, looking at the waitlist outcomes, again with the UNIS registry, uh, you can see the same thing with a more uh, modern cohort. And that these patients you know, have uh, repeated emissions and deterioration, and you know, if we don't intervene early, uh, then the outcomes aren't necessarily what we want them to be. And in this uh, soon-to-be-published manuscript in the Journal of Heart and Lung Transplant, uh, the uh, out transplant outcomes in the international registry was, were looked at, and compared to uh, patients with uh, dilated and ischemic cardiomyopathies, and while you can see that there's uh, early mortality in this cohort, uh, long-term uh, these patients do well and actually do better than the ischemic patients. So when these patients, if these patients make it through in the long term, in general, they do well. So what are the implications for congenital heart disease? Uh, so this was the former system. In the former system, these patients uh, would be listed at status two, so the lowest priority, uh, unless a center was advocating for them and uh, you know, found ways to uh, work with the review board to get them upgraded. And as Dr. Reardon and others can testify, this was not necessarily an easy process because most of the physicians who comprise the review board aren't congenital physicians and aren't necessarily aware of the, the intricacies to these patients. And so with the new system, these patients uh, would start at status four, so higher priority. Uh, and then there, as I'm going to talk about in a second, uh, there's clear pathways to be able to upgrade them to higher tiers so that they can get transplanted in a timely fashion. And uh, for patients with uh, single, single ventricle physiology, uh, this is the pathway to, for upgrade. So if they're experiencing any complications related to congenital heart disease, and this is wide open as you can see, be it protein enteropathy, plastic bronchitis or others, they can be status three. And then if they, meet, if they need inotropes, be it one high dose or, or lower doses, or if they're even intolerant uh, with hemodynamic instability, they can be status two. And if they, have, uh, if they already have a mechanical support device and they have any of those VAD, pre-specified VAD complications, they can be upgraded to status one. Uh, 
Uh, there are also pathways for the dual ventricle patients. And again, if they have uh, heart failure with risk factors for VAD, or they're on inotropes, or they're already on a maximum tolerated inotropes, they can be upgraded to status three. Uh, there also exists, exists a document for hypertrophin restrictive cardiomyopathies, which I'm not going to uh, uh, get into during this talk. Um, but what are the implications? And so this is how this this is using the data that you just modeled to, to create this system, and this is how it looked from 2009 to 2011. So uh, pretty spread out with increasing numbers from status 1A to 2, and this is how using that data it would look from statuses 1 through 6. So the majority are status three and status four. I think it will remain to be seen what it will look like come October when we have a year's worth of data. I get the sense that you know this is not going to quite look the same, and it's probably going to be more status two patients. Um, but we'll see. Uh, but ultimately, we need a heart allocation score to be able to better prioritize these patients, and that's the hope with a new system. This was discussed when the working groups just do a score, but it's felt that the data was not quite there. So again, uh, what I've touched on is the old system, the changes to the new system, so six-year system, incorporating hemodynamic requirements and other patient-specific factors, uh, as well as the broader geographic sharing, which is meant to increase the availability of hearts for the sickest of the sick. So uh, these implemented changes are intended to increase geographic allocation with prioritization for the highest uh, mortality risk patients. Uh, however, there's going to be intended and unintended consequences of this system, and ultimately, uh, this is going to need to be monitored and explored, and whether or not the system will need to be revised is uh, currently up for debate, uh, but ultimately, further data is needed to develop a heart allocation score. Thank you for your attention.